So our first panelist today is Jenna E. Jenna E. Fleming. She is the Assistant Archivist at the Rockefeller Archive Center in New York and serves as a content consultant for the First World War's Letters of H.J.C. Peers, a digital history project. Today, Jenna will be exploring how women in the theatrical world leverage the war effort to widen their roles both professionally and personally in her talk, Women and the Performing Arts as Activism, Activism in the First World War. Jenna? Thank you so much, Heather. And thank you everyone for being here today. I am excited to share with you about women and the performing arts as activism in the First World War. Um, during this presentation, I'll be focusing primarily on the experience of British women, specifically those who were involved with concert parties. These mixed gender acting and musical troops traveled to and performed near the front lines um, to bring theater to soldiers on active service. We'll be examining the experiences of Lena Ashwell, the actress and theater manager who originated the initiative, and Cecily Pierce, a singer who participated in it. When the war struck in 1914, there was a widespread desire and a feeling of duty among citizens to contribute to the war effort in some way. From the beginning, there were strong ties between service, patriotism, and virtue. For men, the primary way to contribute is obviously through military service. Soldiers were seen as brave, gallant, and selfless. While women can't serve directly in the armed forces, there's a very similar expectation as well as a desire for them to contribute however they can. Some examples of this might include providing individual support for male relatives or friends who were serving, raising funds for causes like helping Belgian refugees and sending Christmas dinners to the troops, or volunteering with the many war-related service organizations, such as the YMCA, YWCA, and Red Cross. A lot of these efforts could be conducted from the home front, but many women, particularly young women, wanted to take more active roles. And especially later in the war, when resources became more strained, the options became more available to them. Examples could include nursing, both at hospitals in England and Europe, as well as driving ambulances with the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. In general, we see that the areas that women were relegated to in regards to war work were rooted in these very traditional Victorian and Edwardian ideals. Women were seen as caretakers, managers of the home sphere, and um, much more in touch with both religion and emotion than men were. But at the same time, the new environment of the war and the new social expectations and possibilities that it brought really presented a lot of opportunities for women. So into this fold steps Lena Ashwell. She was born September 18th, 1872 in England and grew up in Canada. She studied music in Switzerland and at London's Royal Academy of Music before beginning her acting career in 1892. She had her big break in 1900 when she originated the title role in Henry Arthur Jones's play, Mrs. Dane's Defense. She had some extremely popular roles during the first part of the decade, and she always had this ambition to go beyond the stage. She began working as a theater manager as well as an actress. So by the time the war broke out, she was already very well known and really well respected as an artist and an authority figure in the arts. Personality wise, she's kind of an interesting figure. Um, she has this very international and cosmopolitan background. She's well educated and she's a social activist. She chose to make an independent living and she did so in the performing arts. In addition to that, her first marriage ended in divorce. All of that put together was very controversial for the era. She was an outspoken supporter of the women's suffrage movement and acted in quite a few suffrage plays which were popular at the time. Yet from the beginning of her career, she very carefully crafted her public image to maintain a strong reputation of respectability. She was outwardly very religious and in 1910, which is the same year that she's appearing in these suffrage plays, um, signed her name to a defense of dramatic censorship laws. She um, 
signed along with several other actors and theater managers and expressed support for laws that would, quote, prevent the public performance of plays dealing with political questions, whether at home or abroad, and to deal with blasphemous or indecent plays. So she's really a woman of contradictions. It's also vital to mention that she has some incredibly important connections. She, um, in 1908, got married to the royal obstetrician, Sir Henry Simpson, and she also had the personal patronage of Princess Helena Victoria, who was a granddaughter of Queen Victoria and who was also patron of the YWCA. Throughout Ashwell's life, she managed to operate within the boundaries of what was considered socially acceptable and advocated for social change, but did so without ever really pushing those boundaries too far. So all of those factors put together put her in a really unique position at the beginning of the war. She was really an early model for the celebrity activist, kind of like an Angelina Jolie or a George Clooney figure. So she took all of that, her love for the performing arts, her desire to contribute to the war effort, her skills as a theater manager, her passion for women's rights and her connections and harnessed it to launch what becomes known as the Lena Ashwell Concert Party. The term concert party referred to a group of performers who staged productions for the troops on the front line. And a few of these parties went out in late 1914, but they really became formally organized in early 1915. And they continued with great success until mid 1919, um, even after the armistice had been officially declared. It's a little tough to pin down um, some specific details because there was so much variety in how the individual groups were set up and operated. But for the most part, a standard concert party consisted of about six performers, men and women, who went on a two to four week tour across active war zones. They put on sometimes two, but up to three shows a day. And the programs varied depending on the performer's individual talents, as well as what the audiences responded to positively. Generally, it was a variety show style performance. Um, Ashwell and her staff of organizers did their best to add a diverse array of talents to even these small groups. There might be singers, instrumentalists, dancers, a host, an accompanist, et cetera, all within the same party. And according to Margaret Leesk, who is one of the number one scholars on Ashwell um, and whose work was really instrumental in putting this presentation together, there were a total of about 600 performers who participated in the concerts during the four years that they ran. Ashwell also provided an alphabetical list of all the artists in the book she later wrote about her experience. Um, the performers auditioned for a place in the party and were judged on talent as well as the unique qualities that they would need to thrive in such a demanding environment. Ashwell did a lot of work herself, but had help from other administrators, including the actress Dorothy Dundas, who served as kind of an experience coordinator for the participants. These women worked really hard to put together groups of people that meshed well both on stage and off and standards were extremely high for both performance quality and personal conduct. The tours took musicians and actors everywhere from France and Belgium to Greece and Palestine. In general, the repertoires consisted of classic popular pieces, songs that most British people at the time would have known and liked. And the stories or skits usually had elements of humor and happy endings. There were some conflicting opinions, but as the entertainer Albert, Ka Albert Kapper later wrote, simplicity and sincer sincerity were the two most important factors in putting together one of these programs. Some of the performers might have participated in a single two week tour, while others continued touring for months or even years. For example, the group of musicians that traveled to Egypt remained there for nearly two years from November 1916 to mid-1918. This freedom and flexibility was really an asset to the organization because if a performer couldn't or didn't want to continue, they didn't have to. 
And if someone um, really enjoyed the performances and had an aptitude for the challenges of wartime, um, they could continue participating on a longer term. So this really helped the program to grow and thrive. Again, these parties were largely co-ed. Um, for the most part, only men were allowed to tour at the very front lines in the most dangerous areas, but that did loosen up a bit in the later years of the war. The work was not entirely free from danger, and unfortunately, two performers lost their lives while traveling with the concert party as a result of a car accident in 1918. Other than that, no significant bodily injuries or deaths seem to have occurred. But like many soldiers on active duty, it's likely that some performers experienced mental health impacts as a result of their experiences. Sadly, these were not recognized at the time. As far as we know, the performers did not receive much preparation for the trauma they were going to witness and experience, nor was there any real support available afterwards. Some of the firsthand accounts of the musicians who played at the hospitals for the severely wounded are especially emotional. Um, you can see an example of that here. Um, and it's very clear that these people were affected by what they had gone through. So next we'll talk a bit about the motivations and impacts of the concert parties. But I did want to make it clear that Ashwell's groups were not the only ones providing entertainment to troops. Um, there were definitely other acting and musical groups who were doing the same thing. And a lot of troops would organize their own concerts or plays. But the Asheville concert parties were the largest and the most far reaching organized effort to do this over the course of nearly the entire war. At their most basic level, the concert party program was truly a genuine attempt to improve the spirits of soldiers on the front lines. This was provided through offering them entertainment, as well as points of familiarity in a deeply unfamiliar and upsetting environment. And it does seem that to this end, they succeeded. Without directly saying it, possibly because they did not have the language to do so, accounts from Ashwell, different performers, and even army doctors talked about the mental health benefits that the arts brought to soldiers on active duty. Attending these shows gave the men a chance to reflect and to see the exploration of emotions acted out in the safe space of the theater. This was both a rare and important opportunity um, because men and especially soldiers were encouraged and expected to repress all emotions. So by providing this emotional outlet and pointing towards the material proof of its benefits, which was improved attitude and performances in soldiers, um, these women were able to demonstrate that the performing arts had value. So, and even today, we're trying to advocate the value of the arts and humanities to society. And it's striking to see that the need to justify their positive impacts is just as present now as it was a century ago. Additionally, musical education and performance had historically occupied kind of a paradoxical place for women. It was expected that well-educated young ladies would be skilled in singing, playing the piano, or other um, instruments, but making a living in the performing arts was not considered appropriate. Um, this was paired with the stereotype of women on stage as morally corrupt, and actresses were often assumed to be or equated with sex workers, an association that was used in a disparaging manner. Granted, by the turn of the 20th century, these concepts were already changing, and Lena Ashwell would not have been able to build the career that she did if that wasn't the case. But um, the women who um, participated in these parties uh, took the primary role in both administration and performance. And so through that, they were able to draw tangible links between the utility of the arts and their necess necessity to a high quality of life. They framed their work as not only socially acceptable, but also honorable. The individuals who participated in the concert parties had the valuable opportunity to build their social and professional networks. Having been cast in a role was seen as an endorsement of artistic skill and making the choice to go was seen as a form of service. Women also proved their physical and mental abilities by withstanding the conditions of war. 
Being a concert party alum was a mark of pride in the months and even years after the war. At the same time, Ashwell and this program she created were limited by the social constructs of the era in which they operated. Performance roles were only offered to young, middle to upper class white women and men. Auditions were highly competitive and preference was given to those who had either credentials from well-known schools or who had studied with highly regarded teachers. And there were significant financial and social barriers to obtaining this type of experience in the first place. When it came to funding the parties, this like the other elements varied a lot. Um, Benefit performances were held in the UK. You can see an example of an advertisement here. I'm sorry, the quality is kind of poor. Um, but performers who had been to the front would then come back and put on the concert and share their experiences. So attendance at these was in high demand and money was raised this way to fund um, the further work. And at times private individuals, members of the aristocracy aristocracy in particular funded individual tours. But there were still significant out-of-pocket costs for performers, such as proper clothing and traveling needs, instrument maintenance, supplies from home, etc. And lastly, there was a strict moral requirement for performers, specifically the women performers. As mentioned, Ashwell herself had strived to keep her good reputation and she expected the same of others. There was a heavy emphasis on religion and virtue, and women were expected to be attractive enough to draw attention and approval, while also having the burden of doing so in an inoffensive way. So to hear about one individual participant's experience, we have a few letters from Cecily Pierce, who toured France as a performer in the concert party in 1917. For a bit of background on her, um, Helen Charlotte Cecilia Pierce, known as Cecily, was born on the 18th of May, 1884, and grew up outside of London. She was the oldest of four children born to an upper middle class family, and she studied music and vocal performance as a young woman. In 1916, she received a licentiate of the Royal Academy of Music, a professional diploma, um, and that's one of the same schools that Lena Ashwell attended. Like many families of their station, the Pierces became very involved in the war effort. Cecily's brother, Jack, served as an officer, her sister, Olive, became a nurse, and her parents were involved in efforts to support local soldiers. The exact dates for when she volunteered are a little fuzzy, but from 1915 to 1916, she was working at a YMCA canteen at a local hospital. And it was possibly through that YMCA connection that she was offered a place with the Ashwell party sometime in 1917. She was 33 years old and single at the time. There are two surviving letters that we know of from her time in France, um, both of which were retained with a much larger collection of her brother's correspondence home from the Western Front. The first letter is dated June 9th of 1917 and was written near the beginning of her time there. From her writing style, we get the image of quite a big personality. She expresses a lot of excitement about the shows she's participating in, but does hint at the demands of the performance schedule, saying that it's been hard on her voice. She mentions that she's having trouble finding water to wash her hair, so we also have evidence that the living conditions were not the cushiest. In this letter, she mentions that she is missing not only her father's birthday, but also her sister's wedding. And that same theme of absence on family occasions comes out in the second letter of hers, written to her mother just before Christmas of 1917. In this one, she writes that she's very busy and traveling from place to place. She says, we have got shows on every day next week somewhere or other. It's hard to say because she could have just been putting on a brave face for her mother, but she doesn't express any kind of sadness or regret for being away from home during the holidays. She even says that some of the performers who went on leave would have stayed if they had the chance, which is probably a bit of a stretch, but nevertheless, she continues to convey a real enthusiasm for her work. We're not sure exactly how long she remained in France or if she had any breaks to go home during that time, but based on the context of the larger collection, 
seems she was in France and performing pretty consistently between June 1917 and about February 1918. She ended her time in the concert party in order to get married on April 9th of 1918. While she spent kind of a short amount of time in the concert party, having been part of it was a really significant moment in her life. She eventually moved to Cornwall where her mother's family lived and community service was huge for her during the Second World War, the interwar years and after. She became county and eventually um, national vice president of the British Women's Legion. And she was also involved with the women's voluntary service through the 1950s. She actually traveled to Morocco on their behalf um, in the 30s. Having been part of the concert parties was seen as an important qualification for her to have any of these leadership roles in the first place. She served as a local justice of the peace, building on the foundation of competence, professionalism, and aptitude for service she had established as a performer in her younger years. In a 1938 newspaper interview about her work, Pierce said that she rarely sang anymore, but credited her experiences with the YMCA and the Asheville Concert Party for preparing her for what would become her career. She had one son and died in 1970 at the age of 86. And if you'd like to read more about her and her family, you can visit the digital history site at jackpierce.org. To wrap up, the Lena Asheville Concert Parties left a lasting legacy in the years following the war for both individuals and on a broader scale. They demonstrated the importance of the arts to society at a vital point in history. As for Ashwell herself, she was awarded an OBE in 1917, and in 1922, she published Modern Troubadours, a record of concerts at the front, which was a book about her experiences with contributions from the performers. She continued to draw from her wartime experience as an advocate for the importance of the arts. In 1925, she gave a speech to the Royal Society of Medicine on drama as a necessity of civilized life, in which the arts were described as, quote, holding the same position in mental well being as vitamins held in relation to bodily health. For Ashwell and her colleagues in the concert parties, particularly women, having served in this way remained a badge of honor. Their achievements represented not only their talent, dedication, and determination but also coolness under pressure, a high degree of compassion and a strong work ethic. Operating under scrutiny and with a lot at stake, these women helped to provide material proof of the value of the arts, continuing the work of their predecessors and paving the way for women activists and performers of the future. Thank you so much and I look forward to hearing your questions. Okay, thank you, Jenna, for a very interesting talk. Um, our next panelist is Melissa S. Gentry. Melissa is the supervisor of the GIS Research and Map Collection at Ball State University Libraries. She's uh, the coordinator of the Notable Women of Muncie and Delaware County Project for Ball State. Today, Melissa will explore women's role in the fight for and against prohibition in Muncie, Indiana, in her talk, The Bleeding Heart, The Bootlegger, and Daisy, The Untold Story of Women in Prohibition, Muncie. Thanks, Heather. Uh, first, I just wanted to give a little background. Um, uh, in 1929, Muncie, Indiana, where uh, Ball State University is located, was the subject of a sociological study. Um, it was one of the largest sociological studies at the time called the Middletown Project. And sociologists studied in, in depth every aspect of life in Muncie. And then it was followed up with other um, projects later and Life Magazine even featured um, an article about the study. And so Muncie has been considered the most studied city in America. It was um, called Middletown to be to represent an average American town. Um, so we, there's a lot of um, information about Muncie, um, but this one era was sort of overlooked. And um, about three years ago, um, the, there was a group formed from the four different archives in Muncie. So we have the Ball State University Libraries, Archives and Special Collections, Muncie Public Library, Minatrista, and then the Delaware County Historical Society. And a group of us formed and we decided that we wanted to use those archives to discover and document notable women in Muncie history um, because they were largely overlooked even in the Middletown Studies Project. 
And so um, we kind of pooled our resources. We decided we were gonna create a list of 100 notable women for the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And now our database includes about 500 women. So it's pretty exciting. Um, and we've, we've done community programming, and now we're trying to incorporate um, student-created projects and community-created projects. There's a, a public history um, professor here at Ball State University, and her students are creating um, documentary videos. Um, we're trying to create lesson plans for K through 12 schools in Muncie. Um, and some of the students here at Ball State have created artwork, some of which you'll see here in the images. Um, they actually created paper dolls of some of the notable women. And I just did wanna point out that it's called Notable Women because um, it includes the good and the bad as you'll see from this program today. So let me go ahead and open up my PowerPoint for you. So this story has been called crazy, scandalous, convoluted. It's definitely complicated, but importantly, this story is being told. It's the story of three disparate women who shared a time and a place, a bleeding heart, a bootlegger, and the sweet, or not, Daisy. Each of them depicted a unique role for a woman during a time in history when women have largely been ignored in the history books. And I know what you're thinking, women have always been ignored, but even in a cursory search of journals and books, it reveals that this particular time in history is really lacking the names of women, the prohibition era. So these are some images of Muncie uh, right around that time of prohibition. In this story, 1917 serves as a watershed year for the women. Woodrow Wilson was president. Women were protesting suffrage at the gates of the White House. Americans were gearing up for World War I. And Muncie had become a, quote, big city after natural gas was discovered in the area just before the turn of the century. Factories popped up, especially glass factories like the Ball Brothers, who produced those icon iconic canning jars. Then came the saloons. By the early 1900s, though, Muncie had a nickname, Little Chicago. There were violent battles between the, quote, wets and dries. They were even known to blow up each other's houses. Crime and corruption in the city appeared rampant. Police were on the payroll of gamblers and blind tiger owners, which were basically joints operating without liquor licenses even before prohibition. In 1919, the city's mayor was sent to prison for fraud, but that same mayor was a proponent of women's suffrage, a supporter of white and black blue collar workers, and an outspoken opponent of the Ku Klux Klan. It's complicated because Muncie was also the scene of high culture. It had opera houses and music conservatories and beautiful architecture and a teacher's college. The city hosted European orchestras and speakers like Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass. And the train station was an important stop for presidential campaigns like Teddy Roosevelt's. This is how the Monty Evening Press explained that city nickname. Quote, little Chicago, it is sometimes called. Muncie, like Chicago, a city of sharp contrasts, culture, slums, industry, loafers, sheer beauty, awful ugliness, great hearts, big grafters, wide awake, half dead, friendly Americans, shallow glitter, unquote. So let's start the story with one of those so-called great hearts and friendly Americans, Daisy Barr. Born in 1875, Daisy became an evangelist at the age of 16 and was an ordained Quaker minister. 
In 1911, Muncie had a referendum on prohibition. Daisy organized the women of the Dry League and planned temperance parades. Over 1,600 women attended her speech at the Weiser Grand Opera House in Muncie. The Wets won the election, but Daisy Barr had made her mark. The newspaper called her, quote, one of the foremost in the fight against the saloons. Daisy also established the Friendly End for former, for former uh, prostitutes and castaways, but the rules that she required of the women made it unsustainable. Daisy preached in support of women's right to vote so that they could vote for prohibition. Daisy, Daisy also believed that women should have the right to vote since immigrant men voted. In the spring of 1912, dozens of the prominent club women of Muncie met at the Muncie Public Library to form a local chapter of the Women's Franchise League. Daisy was a founder and popular speaker. The group's primary goal was to secure the right for women to vote, but they used their platform to tackle various causes to improve the Little Chicago parts of the community. Daisy loved to deliver messages about the behavior of women. She actually spent a night in a Chicago bar judging the women drinkers. She thought that they were the worst drinkers and she included Paris in her evaluation. In the summer of 1916, Daisy was preaching at huge tent revivals with popular sermons like, why girls go wrong. Her sermon called in large borders undoubtedly expressed Daisy's xenophobic message. Another one of the Franchise League founders, this time a real bleeding heart, was the daughter of a former governor of Indiana. Her name was Electa Chase Murphy. Electa loved children and worked as a kindergarten teacher in Muncie beginning in 1896, but she also staged wedding pageants featuring prominent children. Electa and Daisy and the Franchise Leagues in Indiana were thrilled in January of 1917 when the Indiana legislature passed a bill giving women partial suffrage. Muncie had four franchise leagues, including two African-American ones. And these women were on a mission to register women to vote. The leagues in Muncie coordinated their efforts. They hosted picnics, conducted workshops at churches and parks. Membership numbers ballooned. Elected Chase Murphy became a notary public specifically to drive around the county registering women. She also set up shop next to the underwear section at the local department store. She decided to charge men a quarter, but registered women for free, including the African-American women. This is a good time to pause in the story to take a peek at one particular African-American woman who was also about to have an eventful summer in 1917. This was a woman of Little Chicago, considered one of those so-called big grafters. The name Eliza Hughes usually appeared in the newspapers for minor arrests related to alcohol. But in January of 1917, her house was reportedly raided and listed as an illegal resort for the first time. Not coincidentally, that same month, the city's new prosecutor, Horace G. Murphy, took office. Murphy ran for election on a platform of strict law enforcement against blind tigers, gambling houses, and immoral resorts or brothels. Eliza Hughes's house was a trifecta. In the prosecutor's first month in office, he had convicted 51 blind tiger operators. Before Murphy, Eliza Hughes and others paid bribes to police and city officials to look the other way. So Murphy hired constables to raid the establishments that the police ignored and even made in-person arrests himself. The constables conducted almost daily vice raids. Eliza Hughes's so-called joint was raided half a dozen times in the spring of 1917, and Murphy took her to court. The police wouldn't testify, or at least not in a forthcoming way. So Murphy then counted on what Eliza's neighbors saw, quote, disclosing sordid and repulsive proceedings which have transpired in and near the resort, unquote. Here's what the newspaper reported. People residing in the immediate neighborhood of the Hughes home told of Negroes and whites meeting there and of their vulgar actions in the presence of persons passing by. 
pedestrians were greeted by vile epithets uttered by unknown persons in the Hughes home. And young boys and girls running errands for their parents were caused to gaze upon obscenity, unquote. And city officials were entertaining, entertained by nude dancers at Eliza's house, again, revealing the corruption in the city. Then Murphy and the sheriff swooped down on Eliza's club once again and seized 80 gallons of beer and whiskey. Eliza was fined $10,000 in today's money and sentenced to six months in the women's prison in Indianapolis. Eliza's conviction was celebrated by the women, the club women of Muncie. Prosecutor Murphy appointed a woman as a deputy prosecutor to address the women's groups. She was the first ever deputy prosecutor in the United States who was a woman, and she was Electa Chase Murphy, his wife. It was that summer of suffrage and Electa was warning the women about the corrupt mayor in, who was in cahoots with the police. She told the story of Eliza Hughes in graphic detail. The newspaper printed her plea word for word and one can only imagine the pro clutching that it ensued at that meeting. Spoiler alert though, the women didn't get to vote in Indiana and the corrupt mayor was reelected in November of 1917. In the meantime, the state went dry on April 2nd, 1918, nearly two years before national prohibition. Then Horace Mur Murphy won re-election in November of 1918. Out of prison for a year and back in Muncie in the summer of 1919, Eliza Hughes was back in the headlines. It was reported that $10,000 was stolen from her air quotes soft drink parlor. So it sounds like her business was doing well in spite of prohibition. In fact, Eliza was doing very well. In the summer of 1919, she was actually making history. Daga Watson, a bartender at Eliza's club, was arrested for murder in the fall of 1919. In his jailhouse confession, he told the story of his wealthy and powerful boss, Eliza, and her notable summer. Daga was dating a woman named Denver, Colorado Cook, nicknamed Collie. Collie was Eliza's best friend and shared her duplex. Daga explained that Eliza and Collie were the so-called big women in Muncie. Quote, I saw her, Collie Cook, in Springfield, Ohio on July 3rd when she was going to the Dempsey Willard fight with Liza. She came to the hotel where I was staying and told me she was going to the fight and asked me to go with her. She had several rings upon her fingers together with other jewelry, and she had about $900, which is $18,000 in cash today with her. She was dressed like a real lady and I was clothed only as a porter. So I didn't go with her to the fight, unquote. That boxing match was Jack Dempsey winning the heavyweight championship of the world. Seats were selling for $1,200 in today's money to mostly white men. It was actually the first time that women were allowed to attend a championship bout. The fact that two African-American women from Muncie attended such a historic event is pretty incredible. Fast forward to October of 1919 though, Dago shot Kali four times on the street near her house after she broke up with him. Kali Cook died from her injuries at the age of 39. Even in death though, her notable wealth was reported in the newspapers. Her estate was valued at $140,000 in today's money. And the news story reported that she owned $24,000 in diamonds. This ad for the local department store appeared on the same page as the note about Kali. And it's also how I pictured Kali, dripping in jewelry. So Eliza and Kali were doing well enough for diamonds. Was Eliza still bribing the police? And how was she avoiding the wrath of Prosecutor Murphy? Eliza hadn't been in the newspapers at all in 1918. In fact, by that summer of 1919, corruption had once again infiltrated city government. I mentioned that the mayor had, convicted had been convicted of fraud. Well, so was the prosecutor, Horace Murphy. Murphy's defense attorney, quote, pleaded with the jury not to blight the life of that dear wife of his, the little adopted daughters, and the six orphan children that he has reared, 
unquote. But the two were found guilty and sentenced to two years at an Atlanta federal prison beginning on December 9th, 1919. Some considered Electa Chase Murphy to be a so-called fallen woman. But less than two weeks after her husband began his prison sentence, Electa Chase Murphy was advertising her services as an insurance agent. She was a survivor. So Electa was saying farewell to her husband. Eliza had bid farewell to her dear friend, Kali. That same month, Daisy Barr was going to bat for fallen women and most likely would have supported Electa and her denounced husband and denounced her husband. Daisy was evangelizing in factories and shops around the Indianapolis area and preaching about the morals of men. She definitely didn't worry about the prognosis for indicted men. She preached, quote, if a man falls, there are 100 men who would pick him up. If a woman falls, there are 100 waiting to kick her down, unquote. In this way, Daisy was right. In the meantime, that December, Eliza was arrested in New Albany, Indiana. She owned a car, quote, in which Matthew Barry, a young white man, was transporting whiskey from Louisville to Muncie when he was arrested here after a, the car broke down, unquote. Her car was packed with about $20,000 worth of whiskey and wine. And this notably white male driver was working for a successful African-American woman. So Eliza Hughes was a bootlegger, an interstate liquor runner, and apparently she was up the boss of this particular liquor network. After paying $40,000 in a cash bond, the queen of the half world as she was called was reported missing. She was a fugitive. A source told the newspaper that Eliza had quote, packed her extra clothing, collected all available cash and has flown probably toward Canada, unquote. Federal agents kept the pressure on by conducting raids on her former club in Muncie. In fact, federal agents investigating violators of the Volstead Act in Muncie since her disappearance back in 1919 were never able to locate Eliza Hughes. Then in January of 1921, another automobile breakdown with men drivers implicated Eliza. Three Chicago men were towing a fancy car with another fancy car when they were arrested in nearby Kokomo. The men admitted that, that the cars belonged to Eliza Hughes. Eliza was arrested in Chicago and held in the Marion County Jail in Indianapolis until the spring of 1921. She was tried along with more than 50 other defendants in an alcohol and gambling network that encompassed cities around the state. This was one of the biggest prohibition busts in the country and Eliza Hughes was on trial. And so in a sense was the city of Muncie itself. Among the defendants were two local attorneys, a police captain, a prominent manufacturer, another police officer, a justice of the peace, and two of the former constables who'd spent their time arresting Eliza. On March 7th, 1921, 40 of the Muncie defendants were allowed to beg for mercy before the federal court in Indianapolis. The judge listened, but characterized their stories as ridiculous. One defense attorney argued that his client had reformed. The judge jokingly asked if that was even possible in Muncie. His frustration mounted when Eliza stood before the bench from the Muncie Evening Press, quote, it took Eliza Hughes colored a long time to make up her mind to plead guilty. She admitted to the court that she sold whiskey and had paid for protection but denied that she had paid police for this protection. But at last, after getting a lot of laughs from spectators, she decided to plead guilty, unquote. This report that Eliza made the spectators laugh in the courtroom is revealing about her seemingly charming personality. Sentencing for the Muncie crew was December 7th, 1921. The punishments ranged from fines to one day in the Marion County Jail, to two years in Leavenworth. Eliza Hughes was sentenced to three months in the Marion County Jail. Sadly for historians, but hopefully happy for Eliza, this is where her story disappears into the unknown. Her trail vanishes. It's unfortunate that we don't know more about her story. 
Eliza should be recognized as an African-American boss with white men and police on her payroll. She made history as a black woman bootlegger. Unfortunately though, she didn't make the history books. At this point, Electa Chase Murphy and her disgraced husband had opened the profitable, profitable Muncie Baby Chick Company. It is unknown whether Electa as his deputy prosecutor and constant sidekick knew about her husband's criminal dealings, but her so-called great heart must have outweighed the so-called big graft and shallow glitter. She was an adoptive mother and tireless advocate for the fallen woman. In 1918, the Women's Franchise League called Electa a quote, woman of kindness, tact, and good sense, and has saved many women through her persuasion and influence, unquote. When the scandals were fading for Eliza and Electa, that's just when Daisy's sordid and scandalous life got heated. In the 1920s in the Midwest, membership of the Ku Klux Klan surpassed membership in the Deep South. In 1923, notorious KKK Grand Dragon D.C. Stevenson handpicked Daisy Barr to head the Women's Order of the Klan. She became the Imperial Empress. She recruited tens of thousands of members. At a national meeting of the Grand Dragons of the Klan in North Carolina, she was the only woman on the speaking program. Back home, she addressed crowds of over 20,000 at festivals and rallies. Daisy urged women to join the Klan in order to rid the state of, quote, bootleggers, bums, and thugs, unquote. She also raged against Catholics, Jews, and African-Americans. She was popular and powerful. In 1924, the Klan planned to build a hospital in Indianapolis called the Daisy Bar Home, reserved exclusively for Protestant patients. The building commissioner nixed the plan. And soon, Daisy's power was nixed. An anti-Klan Muncie newspaper publisher, George Dale, who had earlier uncovered the details of Muncie corruption, also outed Daisy Barr. He printed that the so-called Quaker clucker with a K had raked in over $1 million from the sale of Klan robes and memberships to women. She fleeced the Klan by pocketing money from these sales. She reemerged again and again, but never had the influence and sway of her earlier preacher days. Each of these three Muncie women were complicated. Each was a mixture of sharp contrasts. The culture, industry, sheer beauty, awful ugliness, great hearts, big grafters, friendly Americans, and shallow glitter. These women were living during a time when racism and wholesome, wholesome ideals conflated. Propriety disguised outright hatred. Entrepreneurial success was a secret in a society seemingly obsessed with alcohol. And sometimes it was the preachers and the bleeding hearts who were the big grafters and the bootleggers who were the great hearts. It's complicated. It's American history. Thank you so much, Melissa. That was fascinating. Uh, very compelling. Um, <laughs> um, so I do think we have some questions um, already being asked. Um, this one is for Jenna um, from Lauren. Beyond analyzing uh, Cecilia's letters, what other research methods did you use? Thank you for this question. Um, I did have slides of sources that I realized I forgot to share at the end, but um, definitely Lena Ashwell's book, Modern Troubadours, and a few other um, things that she had published was um, instrumental in really getting an idea of the thinking behind the whole program. Um, other than that, newspaper articles were the most helpful, I would say. Um, there were interviews with some performers available in um, just like regular papers or journals for kind of like the music community and um, lots of advertisements and 
mentions of alums of the concert parties um, kind of sprinkled throughout here and there in even just innocuous articles about, about different things. So um, I think newspaper articles were probably the most helpful and would have liked to have more sources um, from soldiers themselves or people who attended the concerts, but unfortunately it's difficult to identify those um, because usually it will just mention a concert and not necessarily say if it was connected with, with Ashwell or not. I have another question. Um, this one's for Melissa. Um, can you speak more about the friendly end? Oh, it was, I'm sorry. I think I misspoke. It's the friendly inn, I-N-N. -N. Oh, okay. And it was a house um, that they um, sponsored. She actually was working with the Ball brothers who were, and still are the most mm -hmm. prominent um, family in Muncie. Um, she helped establish the YWCA for women. Um, and the friendly inn was a house um, and she asked for donations of furniture and food and clothing. And um, she was meant to, um, she thought she was going to reform former prosti prostitutes and even young runaway girls, but she enforced so many strict rules on the girls that people quit going and they es escaped. They, she was basically <laughs> <laughs> almost holding them hostage so they escaped. So it was very um, ill-fated and didn't last very long. Um, a follow-up on that, I don't know if you attended, um, there was a session this morning, um, Carolyn Levy talk about the, talked about the Rosine Association. I didn't know if you attended, did you? I didn't, I had classes okay. this morning. Okay, um, right. so this sort of came up uh, in that session, which I, thank, thankfully, I did attend, um, so I can speak to this. Um, so she did some comparison of this, the Rosslyn um, group with the Magdalene Society in Philadelphia, which sounds like the Magdalene Society is much more like the Friendly Inn in terms of being kind of punitive, uh, almost prison-like. I actually had an opportunity to look at some of those records when I, I worked for an organization that has them. Um, but the Rosine one was more, um, one, let women come back if, you know, if they fell off the wagon or they uh, misbehaved, they were always welcoming them back. Um, and also saw that their circumstances were often what led them in certain directions because they didn't have as many options. So it kind of sounds like, you know, which camp that would fall in probably yeah. more the and, and, and later, later in Muncie in the 1920s, another woman who is on our notable women list started a more um, kind <laughs> version of a house like that. And uh, her name is Lucille Saunders. And she's another one that we're investigating her story too. Cool. Well, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I guess I, I just, it's so important, this local history. One, I think it, sh it shows how complex American history is, but it also shows these common patterns um, in various cities. Uh, yeah. So that's uh, really exciting to me. This this symposium kind of gave us gave us a glimpse at some of these commonalities um, across the country, which is really cool. And it's um, exciting for us in Muncie because of the Middletown studies that started in 1929. It's almost like we're doing a continuation of that, and just with a more focus on the women. Okay, so I have a few other questions. Um, Jenna, did the Ashwell parties continue in some form after the war? or their goals carried forward in other ways, or did it just go away? Yes, so after returning to England, um, Lena Ashwell established a group called the Lena Ashwell Players and uh, stage productions at a lot of different theaters in London um, and toured to other cities in the UK mostly. Uh, and then I think like the legacy, I would say, of, of the, um, the parties themselves come out in the Second World War when from the beginning, there are organizations like the YMCA and um, YWCA are continuing to stage these concerts and variety shows and performances um, in a lot of different areas. So it kind of took the idea and, and continued it um, in later years, definitely. Um, another question for either of the speakers. How do you believe your research contributes to women's studies or the advancement of women's status in society? Do you want to take that one, Melissa? <laughs> um, 
Well, for us, um, we, we're, we, a lot of the programming that we've done um, in the past year has been related to suffrage. And um, I think even just presenting these programs about women in local history and, and digging up these women who have been neglected all these years, I think it's just important to realize like the three women that I presented are all very different, um, but they were all kind of um, in a way kind of pushing women's rights. They all believed in women's rights and they all believed in equality and independence, but in kind of different ways, obviously. And so I think just learning about them um, is, is a highlight to studying women's history and just having that record available. I agree with that. I think um, it's interesting um, to go into a time period like the First World War when so many of the sources and so many of the stories that we know primarily come from and are about men. And obviously that's true kind of throughout history, but um, specifically to male dominated periods um, and, and seek out those stories of women and um, bring them to the forefront because there have been so little studied um, in general. And to be honest, I didn't really know that there were even any women bootleggers, you know, until we started researching this. I had no idea. And then to find out that there were African-American bootleggers that were, I mean, $10,000 stolen from her safe. She was very wealthy. I mean, very wealthy. And I just had no idea. Honestly. It's a great, amazing story. This is just amazing. I didn't know there were women bootleggers either. I suspected there was, but to, oh my gosh. Yeah, I mean, she had power. She had serious power. <laughs> <laughs> one of the one of the men who was arrested in the, the statewide sweep that they did in 1921 was an executive at the um, Warner Gear Company, which um, later became Borg Warner, which is the sponsor mm -hmm. of the Trophy of the Indianapolis 500. So it was a very important Muncie company, and um, he was arrested, and he had purchased his alcohol from Eliza. So. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Um, okay. Also, I think for Jenna, it's interesting that the Asheville parties were cast as bringing arts to the soldiers. Do you happen to know if the World War II era USO concert tours were talked about as art specifically, or if it was more about simple entertainment from home? I think it's a bit of both. I mean, I think even the Asheville concert parties would really highlight that like entertainment perspective um, and element of, you know, these soldiers were in countries where people spoke different languages and they were in this very monotonous, um, difficult routine. And so they would really, I think, draw people in, in any way that they could. Um, and it, for a lot of attendees, I think we're there just by virtue of the fact that it was a change from their everyday life at that point. So um, it, there was a lot of very like highbrow um, theory behind it. And when Lena Ashwell speaks and writes, she's very focused on like the religious benefits, the emotional benefits, but I don't think that that's how it was portrayed um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And my guess is that it was it was similar in the Second World War, um, but it was definitely kind of a, a dual um, view of it in in these First World War um, programs as well. Well, I'm sorry we have to wrap up. There was one additional question we can't get to um, because we need to finish. Um, so thank you so much, Melissa and Jenna, um, for really interesting, thought provoking talks today and um, thank everyone for attending the symposium and I guess we have a sort of wrap up at five. <laughs>